Welcome everyone to The Stateless Atheist. Today, I'm gonna to be speaking to Tom Brown about um, ethnicity, race, how growing up in the United States and being part of the Liberty Movement have changed his views and how they've actually affected his views. Um, the, the race and ethnicity has affected his views on Liberty or the United States. So let's begin the conversation. Welcome, Tom. Yeah, thanks for having me. For starting off, please describe your political views. I understand you lean libertarian, but that is quite a big tent. Can you narrow it down a little bit for the audience? Yep. Um, I consider myself, of course, libertarianism. Uh, I'd say more so minimalism, although I don't necessarily disagree with anarcho-capitalism if someone chooses to leave the state. I believe that they should be able to do so. And uh, really focus on, the uh, main thing that I would really like to focus on is property rights. Uh, that's my main focus. That's mainly because I'm hugely into uh, real estate. So uh, the property rights is something that I'm quite focused on. And another thing in the libertarianism camp that I'm fond, uh, very fond of is the whole concept of uh, individualism. Uh, because, at least for myself growing up, you're kind of put into your own box saying, well, you're Black, so you're Democrat, you can't do nothing about that. So individualism is a huge thing that I focus on too, because people just seem to not understand that just because you're a certain, you know, ethnic group, you have to, you, you don't always want to think a certain way that follows that ethnic group or the commonality of it. Yeah. Okay, so as a black man, what has been your experience growing up in the United States? Has there been any racism uh, against you? Have you witnessed racism against others? Yep. Yeah, um, actually growing up, this is, a uh, going back to my grandfather, he, when he, bought this house. I live in, of course, Detroit, Michigan. I grew up off Eight Mile. He bought his house and directly behind his house was the physical manifestation of redlining. There was an actual wall that separated whites and blacks. Of course, by the time I was born, the wall was irrelevant. But back when he purchased the house, he lived on the black side and on the other side of it was where white people were. So straight out the get-go, really, because, you know, you're told that as soon as you ask what the wall is, so straight out the get-go, you do realize that racism is a thing. And growing up, you, you notice a lot of, um, at least cultural differences. Um, at least when I was growing up in Detroit, the world that I knew before I entered my uh, 19 and tw or, uh, early 20s, what I knew was when you walk in a bank, the only thing I know was that there are two doors, they both lock, you have to walk through a metal detector, and of course, then you can enter the bank after you walk through the metal detector, and there's always glass walls separating, well, bulletproof glass separating you when, you know, you win, say, gas stations, fast food places, um, and there's just so much more uh, added security uh, even in high school, we, as students, uh, we went to Mumford, the security officers commonly maced entire hallways so that we wouldn't supposedly run amok or, and they um, literally, security guards would literally fight the students, mace the students randomly for behavior. And so there's a lot going on to make you think that, you know, as a, well, as you get older, you get exposure, and you realize that's not what the world is. It really makes you think like you're kind of like a second-class citizen. Because I know that one huge thing that was a life-changing thing was when I was about 19 years old. The simplest thing went to a Domino's pizza joint outside of the hood of Detroit. And I was completely blown away that there was not a bulletproof glass separating me and the cash register. Mm -hmm. and 
that itself was a life-changing experience as simple as it is looking back on it because that made me actually think if that's the case of course then I walk in a bank and I find out there's no bulletproof glass there's no metal detectors things like that so things like that it's just like yeah um you feel like a second class citizen because I lived 20 years living thinking that was my reality to thinking that was the reality of the entire country only to find out that that is not the case in a lot of places. Wow, that's interesting. So what has been, say, the worst experience you've had growing up? The worst experience I had growing up, um, you mean in terms of racially or just a bad experience? Uh, Racism, bigotry. Racism, bigotry. uh, Probably the worst experience was I was at the mall with my friends. I want to say I was about 15 years old. And no, sorry, I wasn't 15. I was 18, sorry. I was at the mall with my friends. I was 18, had some friends at the time that was like 16, 17, 18. And uh, we were pretty much profiled in order to leave the mall. And it almost got to the point where we had to restrain one of our friends because the security guards were kind of pegging us on and he was, the friend was 17 and kind of rowdy, 17. He was about to fight the security guard. And then of course we would have all gotten arrested. So that, that's the um, thing in terms of racism was being, you know, profiled there and, you know, the police comes and everything. Uh, luckily it didn't escalate to anything because I, of course, know a bunch of friends who have way worse stories. That was kind of like a bit of a lucky one in terms of direct racism. That sucks. So, as part of the libertarian movement, how has your experience been with racism within the movement itself? Have you found any racists within the movement? Has it been about equal to your experience outside the movement, or has it uh, been different? Well, racism and the liberty movement, it was more so the kind of like the black people that's in my own circle, my own sphere of influence was where I kind of got a scarlet letter to where people start to, well, you really get exposed to the concept of people saying, you're not supposed to think like that. And it's kind of like, Let's just say I support, obviously, lower, if not no taxes. Um, And so they might, you know, I get into a huge discussion with another black person that's saying, you know, you, you know, rich people are terrible and uh, calling me stupid. uh, uh, Sometimes uh, one time I got called a coon. Um, It's not not frequent as of now, it starts to die down but it's really just the people that's in my own sphere of influence. But on the other side, on a more lighter note too, I do have a bunch of people, a bunch of black people who approach me, um, especially during my college days and talked about how brave I was for actually expressing my thought because I noticed one thing I found out was that the things that I believe isn't necessarily uncommon, but because black people are uh, so focused on a certain realm of thought they're too afraid to express what they actually believe to where some a lot of people might be more so leaning towards uh in certain aspects libertarian ideals they won't speak on it because they know that they're democrat they have to be democrat if they're not democrat they'll kind of they'll get their own scarlet letter so okay at what point in your life did you become a libertarian and what pushed you in that direction? What pushed me in the direction of libertarianism was I was like a lot of people. I was a Ron Paul guy in the 2012, uh, prior to finding out about him, I was actually socialist more so probably communist even. And then you kind of, as I was, I want to say 17, you kind of start learning about kind of start with the constitution is kind of like the go-to 
and then you kind of bridge on to the whole limited government context. And eventually, I had a friend, Taran, who texted me and told me during the 2012 election to look up Ron Paul. And I looked him up. And the part that really won me over to libertarianism, it wasn't actually the ideals. Uh, that was secondary. What won me over was Ron Paul was kind of in the realm of saying, take care of yourself. And that worked for me. That won me over because from the day I was born all the way up to, you know, the 2012, um, so um, about 17 years or so, 18 years, the only thing that I knew was that the government was supposed to take care of me. That was my entire uh, mindset to the point to where when I was a teenager and I was looking for jobs, the only thing that I really did was go to Michigan's government website because what I thought I was supposed to do was to go on the website, just fill out an application, put your standard information and address, and the state representative would actually call me and tell me to go work at Burger King for a year or something or a week. So it was the 2012 that really introduced me to it because I was really fixated on, wow, I can, you know, live my own life. I can, you know, make my own money. I can do anything that I want to do. So have your views changed much since 2012 or you're roughly in the same ballpark? Uh, no, it, it, I would say it changed a lot because in 2012, I probably would have considered myself more so like a libertarian socialist opposed to just saying I'm libertarian or a minimalist. Um, so it, I would say it changed pretty significantly, um, especially when, say, with the Constitution, the most thing that I would do in 2012 would say the Constitution says this, so X, Y, and Z. And now I'm just, now I'm kind of like, no, there are some aspects of the Constitution that I would disagree with, of course, and things like that that needs to be edited or just kind of like remove the whole thing, the whole document. You were closer to a constitutionalist at first. Somewhere between a libertarian socialist and a constitutionalist. Somewhere in between there. Okay. That's interesting. Um, one second. So just to get more of um, perspective, uh, I don't know how much you've studied uh, critical theory. Uh, in critical theory, there's a – they use the term uh, racism to mean um, – Power. Institutional racism is all that really exists within critical theory. Now, I'm not really, I don't want to get into a conversation whether that's the correct um, definition or not. I'm, I'm here more for experiences to find out how people's experiences and, and we can learn from them. So have you witnessed any bigotry from the black community? Now, I understand it's very much, it could be from the bigotry, the racism against them that's caused it that way, but I'm just curious if you've witnessed it yourself. So if I witness... Any bigoted, blacks yeah. being bigoted towards whites. Oh, bigoted towards whites? Or even yeah. towards other blacks. Oh, yeah, um, of course. Uh, there was a situation just uh, when I was about... 20 years old where there was a white person that just moved across the street from my house and uh, my mom uh, spoke to me about it and I asked her was that was those white like white people just moved across the street and she just kind of nonchalantly told me yeah they moved across the street but they'll be gone in about a week or so and asked her what she meant by that and she said because the neighborhood They'll, they don't care for having just white people there. They're going to harass them and break into their homes. And well enough, within about four days, they had to leave because their house was completely vandalized. And that was from, well, just completely on the basis of they were white people moving into the neighborhood. Uh, so what are your views of the Black Lives Matter movement and the situation in the United States at the moment? I support the concept of Black Lives Matter. Uh, if we look into all their demands and stuff, I'm sure there's a lot that I could disagree with. But 
I like that they're kind of like starting the discussion. What I disagree with is I don't quite agree with what they're saying in terms of their demands. I don't feel like they're coming to the table with anything that's worth strong negotiations. Kind of like how they need the sorry the Congress needs to get rid of qualified uh, immunity for police officers. That's not in that's not in the actual discussions of Black Lives Matter. They're talking about getting justice for the black people that's getting killed, but the actual solution for that isn't getting the one police officer put behind bars. It's removing the qualified immunity to stop future problems. Yes, that war, things like that. Yeah, because it's the abuse that the police does that needs to be addressed opposed to constantly being ready to march every time a you know, black person's killed which that holds its value, but there has to be something that's actually sustainable that will change, which is dealing with qualified immunity. So I agree with the concept of Black Lives Matter, but their demands don't quite reach. Where so you want needs. at least some of their demands to be go further, like qualified immunity, not just this cop, let's prosecute all cops that do wrong. Yeah, qualified immunity. Um, there's a discussion to defund the police. I actually, you know, just take it a step further and say, don't just defund them, just get rid of them. Uh, we can do like a private police force, or if you, or if people in black communities want to rely on the city for policing, create a new whole new concept of the policing because it's not working. Yeah, kind of like the Black Panthers were trying to be before the yeah. United States forced uh, gun control on them. Yeah, because what the Black Panthers did, it it was a nice check on the city's abuse of power. Yes. Because, of course, the qualified immunity for the concept then would have been significantly worse against blacks. But the Black Panthers, they had, you know, they had guns and they pointed it at the police officers and they police officers were forced to talk to the Black Panthers about the problems. To the Black Panthers were just determined saying if the person needs to go with the police or not. And that at least is significantly better than the situations going on right now. Yeah, definitely. So, uh, where is it? What's your views that, um, for um, the Second Amendment? The Second Amendment of uh, I take it more so as a literal thing saying, well, you know, the whole will not be in frame. So I'm just kind of, I would rather just get rid of all the regulatory gun laws on the federal level and well, really the state too, because the whole concept of it is the problem that we have now, especially in the black community is the guns were supposed to be used against the state when it's being tyrannical. If say a police officer, a police officer is about to, murder someone yeah they're being tyrannical you therefore have the right to shoot the police officer they gotta go there's no way fans or butts about it that's so i don't really care for the regulations especially the federal regulations in place to kind of like restrain the concept of the second amendment have you witnessed uh in your life any body that you know personally be uh targeted by the police, either arrested for something wrong, or even if it was something that would may be justified by law, not necessarily justified by morality. Like, oh, they were arrested because they had marijuana on them, but that shouldn't be a, a law. Um, something that I've like seen or do, that I've physically you know? seen or know? Someone I know. I, I know a person, he, when he was 14, he wasn't like thrown in prison for, you know, anything, but he was directly profiled by the police to where he was just leaving a friend's house and he just had a, a book bag with him and his friend and they were just trading Yu-Gi-Oh cards, nothing, you know, illegal or crazy, but the police officer just randomly drove by the house and just saw two black teenagers walking out of the house with just book bags of all things and pointed their gun, well, pointed his gun at them, told them to sit down, 
on a gate and ransack their bag to basically dumping their bag contents to see if they had drugs. So which of the um, cases we've had recently, either or over the last couple of years, either Tamara Rice or um, about, uh, George uh, Floyd, or which was the one that was uh, shot by the people because they were doing a construction, he was on the construction site. Um, which do you think was the worst and why? I wouldn't really consider any to be necessarily the worst because they're all, you know, in their own light travesties. So I wouldn't really label which one's the worst. Uh, what I'm more so focused on is will any of them actually get the justice that they actually deserve? Yes. Um, Cause I can't really focus on. No, I'm just wondering like them. if any one of them hit you harder than the others, like hit you emotionally harder. Uh, no, because you feel the you you feel the outrage of of the situation, but also something that's a concept is it's right about now in you know Black America you expect it. Uh, you're, you're angry, but it's not shocking. Like even if you watch the video, it's kind of like it's always upsetting, but this has been an ongoing thing since you know america's been a exist you know existed so the whole the whole concept is just continuous just in different forms how do you feel when you hear somebody say the rhetoric uh that you, we often get from the right oh who cares about the few people that the the police uh, the few blacks that the police kill the blacks kill more blacks than anything else what, what do you feel in the well how do you respond to that I think it's a really, I find it to be a terrible argument because really uh, if people want to focus on blacks killing blacks opposed to police killing blacks, that has nothing to do with the situation of the police killing blacks. And also just on population, if you have a, let's just say a study that's majority of a race, you're going to find that people of the same race are going to kill each other yeah. They're in the same geographical location. So I'd more so just, focus on the fact that a police officer who is a trained professional killed, you know, a black man or a black woman, which is, should be the focus opposed to black on black crime, because that's quite irrelevant to the situation. Totally agree. Okay, so what do you think should be the main takeaway from this interview? The main takeaway, um, I'd say focus on ending qualified immunity uh, because no matter what happens, we, I'd say we've made progress in terms of just blacks being in America as a whole, I wouldn't say by much, but progress. But qualified immunity is a really, is a huge step forward to making sure that the state at least will not abuse some power against, well, black people. Okay. So if you had three to five different books, articles, movies, music, or any other form of media that has inspired your beliefs, what are they? And you would want other people to check them out. Um, inspires my beliefs uh well i would say especially speaking to like a black black a black person especially would be something by either thomas soul or walter e williams um a huge reason for that is when you get started in the liberty movement and you're black you find out that frankly there's just a lot of white people and you don't feel quite included because you're looking for someone that looks like you from the the mental start from the get-go until you accept that there are people like you, just not as, you know, not as abundant. So something by Thomas Sowell or Walshie e. Williams, not a specific uh, book or article, but I just recommend those two in general. Okay. 
Do you have anything else to add before we go? Because this was a very interesting interview. Um, something that I would like to add would be to really like if when with situations with the police brutalities and stuff to take a moment and for everyone to kind of take a moment to understand where the perspective of where kind of like black people are coming from because there is a lot of pain and anguish in the black community uh to this day because redlining still exists whether it be schools you know it could be just be school zip codes but redlining still exists um and that's a whole like prison complex and there's a lot so there's a lot of like issues and topics going on and one thing that I did want to mention, at least for the concept of the interview, was something that's always something that's always uh, a topic with Black people as a whole reparations argument. Just to mention that, because although I support it, uh, I go beyond the. A lot of people stop at slavery was ended in the mid eighteen was it eighteen sixty four or something, um, something like that. But I like to definitely always mention the whole concept of reparations because there has been the whole concept of injustices, not just in the 1800s and slavery, but beyond. And because people argue, and I understand it saying we shouldn't pay something that was over 100 years ago, but the concept goes beyond to that because you have the FDR redlining in the 30s and the Black Wall Street massacre bombing that happened and even all the way up to the whole civil rights movement that had to happen in the 60s because of segregation. And a lot of that really kind of like tampered with the economics of black people because although today they're very focused on the Democratic Party and welfare programs, there was a time where they were trying to be self-efficient and they had their own you know, grocery stores, banks, and other things that they need for communities to function. but the government, gov the federal government, state governments did come in and, well, literally bomb some places, but completely police and ruin those intentionally. For people listening that have never heard the term redlining before, can you explain it to them? Yeah, redlining is, in terms of housing, it's when, let's just say FDR, he was trying to create or get America back on track and he wanted to have the federal government kind of provide housing towards you know americans and the problem that they faced was that they didn't want to give mortgages to basically the wrong people so they kind of created an actual drawn red line to show that these certain communities via zip codes shouldn't receive these mortgage benefits which were the black communities opposed to the white communities. Wow. And just to, just to mention, because uh, I mentioned zip code redlining with schools, the redlining still does, is a thing to, because schools do redlining, they don't call it redlining, they just do zip codes because there are a lot of people, let's just say in Detroit, have a, we have a terrible school system and there are parents who are willing to drive their kids to another city with a better schooling system, but the state refuses to let them like take the kids to another school district. They're forced to go into the horrible school districts that, well, the horrible DPS school system. And that's a very common thing that really holds back, you know, black people, because if you grow in a poor community and you have the means to go into a better community, give your kids a better education and the state denies you, that's just putting you and your family in an endless cycle of, you know, poverty because the schools don't teach you anything. So you generally have, you often have uh, other blacks come up to you trying to push you towards the Democratic Party. And what would be your normal response to them? Well, although it's not as frequent anymore, a uh, huge response that I get is, I mean, a huge response that I say is to kind of remind them that, like, we, we're living in Detroit, and the Democrats have ran 
excuse me, the Democrats have ran Detroit for almost 50 years, and each year it gets worse. Like, it gets, every, every year it gets worse and worse, and I just tell them that I'd more so argue that the Democratic Party has an incentive to keep the cities of the, like, these black cities in a bad condition, because no matter what, they still constantly vote for the Democrats. So if they were to actually somehow you know, fix the city and Detroit, well, the, say the blacks and the poor communities actually get more income, they might be subject to vote for, I guess, if you want to say red and blue Republicans, because now they're making more money, they want less taxes taken out or something like that. So I just always remind them that no matter what, if you can vote for Democrats, but what have you got out of it for the past 50 years? You're in a worse situation. The communities are worse. Crime is rampant. And all that really spirals back to the economics of the situation. Yes, people are going to be violent because they're hungry. They're always going to be more agitated if they know that they don't have anything to eat or if their kids are hungry. So being a libertarian, I don't think you'd say the Republican Party's the answer either. What would you say is the answer? I would say, really, I wouldn't say, I, although in the situation of voting, I would, of course, say, you know, sure, vote libertarian. They'll be a little bit more relaxed with the rules. But I wouldn't actually say neither direct party is the answer. The true answer is getting involved in the whole capitalist system because you, you have to own stuff. If you have to get involved in the game, you have to get skills to get better jobs. A huge thing in black communities, especially in Detroit, is the Arabic community and mainly the Arabic community owns all the businesses. And so if you wanna actually fix the situation, voting doesn't actually fix anything. What really fixes it economic is, is getting involved in it economically because if you buy the businesses, gas stations, liquor stores, grocery stores, you'll have capital. And when you have the capital, you can invest in your community regardless of what the city says. Okay. Thank you very much, Tom. This was a great interview. Thank you. Thank you, everyone, for joining me. Please like and subscribe. I'll see you soon.